The Bible says that the law strengthened sin. It didn't strengthen us. It strengthened our enemy, sin. Boy, what a radical concept. I know most of you think that can't be so, but it's exactly what the Word says. We're going to talk about that today, so stay tuned for the Gospel Truth. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that emphasizes God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Tuesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm continuing a series talking about the true nature of God. I've been teaching now about what the real purpose of the law is. And most people don't understand this. I used the scriptures yesterday out of 1 Timothy chapter 1 where it says we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, implying that there is an unlawful use of the law or a wrong use of the law. And it says that the law was not made for a righteous man. That's talking about a New Testament Christian. The law wasn't made for those who have already put faith in Christ. The law was made for a man who hasn't recognized his need for God and is trying to approach or relate to God based on their own goodness. The law was given for them to condemn them and to make them so guilty in their own conscience that they would recognize they can't change their self, they can't save themselves, and they would just have to throw themselves on God for mercy. That's the purpose of the law. And that's the exact opposite of what is being used in church as a whole today. The church, by and large, is telling Christians that you need to recognize your ungodliness and you've sinned and God won't answer your prayers as long as you've got a sin in your life. God won't fellowship with a dirty vessel. God won't use a dirty vessel. Well, I want you to know that God hadn't got any other kind of vessel to use. If you're just talking about our physical self, all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But if you are in Christ, then you're a new creature and I am not a dirty vessel. The law isn't made for a New Testament saint. The law is made for a person who doesn't recognize their need for God. And I shared a lot about that yesterday. Let me take another verse out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 56. And they're going to put this on the screen. But you might want to write this down. Go to your Bible or something and look this up because many of you aren't going to believe this. This is just so contradictory to the way that people believe, but this is a scripture. 1 Corinthians 15, 56 says, The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Radical concept. I bet you that if you haven't studied this out, and if God hasn't given you a revelation that there's a difference between the Old Testament law and the New Testament grace, if you aren't firmly established in this, if I was just to make this statement and say that the law strengthens sin, nearly every one of you would reject that and say, oh, that's not true. That's not what the Bible says because that's not what most of us have thought and have been taught. We've actually been taught that the law was given to help break the dominion of sin over our life. It's exactly the opposite according to Scripture. The strength of sin is the law. The law strengthened sin. Our enemy, our adversary, sin. It didn't strengthen us in our battle against sin. It strengthened sin in its battle against us. You know, if you were fighting somebody, if you were going to go out to battle, let's just say, for instance, you know, David and Goliath. Here you are fighting this giant. And if you could discover where their strength lied, or lay, however you're supposed to say that, if you could discover what the source of their strength is, wouldn't it be to your advantage to cut off the source of that strength and defeat your enemy by weakening them? But instead, the Bible says that the law strengthened our enemy. The law made our enemy stronger to help it defeat us. Now again, think about this. I know this is contrary to what most of us have thought, but that doesn't mean it's wrong. You know, if you would look at the results most of us are getting. You know, I'm not talking to you personally. I'm saying this generally. But if you would be honest, I've dealt with so many people, I know this to be true, that most of us who profess to be born again, who love God, who desire to live for God and to know God and to make Him known to other people, 
Most of you with that pure desire would have to admit that you know what, it seems like that you're frustrated. There are things in your life that are overcoming you instead of you overcoming them. It seems like that your lust, your desires, your failures in certain areas of your life are stronger than you. And you just can't understand why. You love the Lord, you seek the Lord, and you don't understand why you aren't prospering more. The fruit is not what you see promised in the Word of God. And so there's a discrepancy between what you're experiencing and what the Word says. And you can't figure out why it is. And yet here I am telling you something that is totally contrary to the way you think and your tendency is to reject it. But I'm saying, if your fruit isn't right, why do we hold on so strongly to these concepts that we have if it isn't producing the right fruit? I think it's time for a change. I challenge you to take the Word of God and compare it to what you're believing and then change what you believe. So I'm saying some things that really challenge our belief system. Most of us, like I said, if I was just to tell you that you know that the law strengthens sin, most people would reject that and I mean immediately say, no, not so. The law was given to help us overcome sin. But 1 Corinthians 15.56 says the strength of sin is the law. The law didn't strengthen you in your battle against sin, but it strengthened your enemy, sin, in its battle against you. That's what the scripture says. And some of you say, I don't understand. How could that be? Here's what I believe. The law wasn't given to help you overcome sin. The truth is sin had already defeated us. And see, this is what the Bible calls the deceitfulness of sin. Some of us think that because we haven't gone out and plundered and murdered and raped and done some of the things that other people have done, that we aren't as bad a sinner as somebody else. We term, you know, we say, well, we've all sinned, but I'm a good sinner versus a bad sinner. I want you to know in God's sight there is no such thing as a good sin or a good sinner. They're all sin is bad. And if you have been corrupted a little bit, the whole thing's corrupted. Now some people don't have that concept. Some people think, well, a little bit of stuff, it's okay. But you know, that's not God's attitude. God desires purity. God is 100% pure. There is no darkness. There's no sin. There's no impurity in Him. You know, I heard a man one time who was trying to reason with his teenage uh, child about that they wanted to go see some movie and the parent had said no because it had some sexual and... Uh, some sexual explicit things and some profanity in it. And the child was saying, but it's not a lot, it's just a little bit. And he was saying, well, I don't even want a little bit. And they were saying, Dad, you're so strict, how dare you do this? So anyway, that argument ended, and later that day, the dad fixed brownies for the kids. And right before he served it to him, he said, now let me explain to you. He says, this is, these are real brownies. This is our normal brownie mix. But I want you to know that I went out and got a little bit of dog poop and put in there and mixed it into the brownies. And he says, now it's not a lot. It's just a little bit of dog poop in here. So that's going to be okay. <laughs> and these kids just, no way. We aren't eating if it has any. If it's got any dog poop in it, it we aren't eating. And he says, but a little bit couldn't hurt anything. And then he taught them a lesson. That see, they were saying, well, a little bit of sexual immorality, a little bit of profanity is okay. No, when you see things from God's standpoint, who is perfect purity, perfect light, if you've got any sin in you whatsoever, you're defiled by sin. There isn't such a thing as good sin, bad sin, good sinners, bad sinners. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the law was given for people who were under the deceitfulness of sin, thinking, well, yes, I've sinned, but I, at least I'm not like this publican over here. I fast twice in the week. I pay tithes of mint and anise and cumin. See, that's one of the examples that Jesus gave of the religious Pharisee who looked down his nose at the public and a tax collector who considered him to be so ungodly, I'm better than him. The Lord said that the publican was the one who was accepted by God, not the religious Pharisee. See, it's not God grading on a curve. It's like, you know, the standard God says, all right, here's a 30-foot ceiling. 
to be able to live, if, if God was to just walk in and say how somehow or another I'm going to kill every person that can't jump and touch this ceiling, it wouldn't matter if you were a couch potato and could only get an inch off the ground. It wouldn't matter if you were in a wheelchair and couldn't even get off the ground. It wouldn't matter if you were Michael Jordan and could jump 10 or 15 feet. If the minimum was 30 feet, we're all going to die. And see, that's in a sense what the Lord did. There were people who were thinking, well, you know, I can jump higher than this person. I'm holier than this person. I'm we were comparing ourselves among ourselves and measuring ourselves by ourselves, which the Bible says is not wise. I believe that's 1 Corinthians 10 something. And we tended to compare ourselves and we thought, I just, surely God's going to accept me because even though I'm not perfect, I'm better than this person, better than this person. See, God needed to bring you out of your deception and let you know that all you, though you think you're a good sinner, that sin has defeated you and that you can't overcome it and that you are defiled. Just a little bit of sin is like putting a little bit of dog poop in your uh, brownies. It's unacceptable. A little bit of sin makes you unacceptable. It doesn't make you more acceptable than somebody who's got a lot of sin. And so God wanted to show you how bad sin was and how that you are defiled and that you can't reach the minimum requirement. You need to cry out for mercy. So how did he do it? He gave you a law that said, one through 10,000, thou shalt not do this. You shall do this. And if you violate these laws, you're dead. I reject you. And it's amazing that the church has somehow or another embraced the law as a good thing and said, oh, thank you, Father, for showing me step one through 10,000 what I must do to have you love me. How in the world could Satan have ever deceived us into thinking that this was a wonderful thing God gave us? I'm showing you scripture and there's a lot more that I'm going to show you that says that the law strengthened sin. The law made sin come alive. The law made lust rise up on the inside of you. The law wasn't a positive thing that brought you closer to God. The purpose of the law was to make sin come alive on the inside of you, to strengthen sin so much that all of a sudden you just realize, man, God, I can't overcome this on my own. God, help me. And that's what the purpose of the law was to do, was to knock you flat of your face, to take away self-righteousness from you so that you would come to the Lord. But then it says over in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, around there where we read this on our program yesterday, that once you become a righteous man, once you get into right standing with God, that the law isn't made for a righteous man. It's not for you. God doesn't want you. Once you are driven to God through your need that the law points out, God doesn't want you to live under the law and to be guilt-ridden and to have sin strengthened in your life through the law. Instead, He's wanting you to get out from under the law and to start relating to Him based on faith in Jesus, not based on your performance. Boy, that's a mouthful. I just said some things right there that it took me years, decades to learn. But you know, once I've seen it, it's changed my life. And I know that there's people watching this program right now that you are struggling in some of the exact same ways that I have been, that many people are. And you are thinking that I've got to do all of these things to please God. And you're trying. You're giving it all you've got. You're wearing yourself out. Your heart's right. But you are frustrated. And it seems like that the more you try, the worse you get. That's what the law was intended to show you, that you can't save yourself. Again, I go back to this scripture. The strength of sin is the law. God gave the law to strengthen sin. To make sin come alive is what it says over in Romans chapter 7. So for the person who was deceived into thinking, you know, I'm a really good person. I don't dip or cuss or chew or go with those that do. Man, I am living a relatively holy life. I thank God has to accept me. I mean, after all, God's got to accept somebody. None of us are perfect, but God's got a quota. And so even though I'm, I may not make a hundred, if I'm in the top 10%, then God's going to give me an A. Nope, God doesn't grade on a curve. God wanted you to recognize that if you don't make a hundred on this test, if you sin in the slightest way, then you are defiled and you need a Savior. So how did he get that point across? He just said, all right, 
You think you're holy? Let me show you what holiness is. And he gave all of these laws that condemned you and that actually made you lust for things. You know, just follow this logic here. If you didn't even like chocolate, I don't know how you exist if you don't like chocolate, but let's just assume that you didn't even like chocolate. It's not even a temptation for you. But you know what? If I was wanting to show you that in yourself you just can't overcome anything. You need to depend upon God. You by yourself are weak and frail. You know all I'd have to do is come to you and say, I've just deposited a million dollars in your bank account. But here's the catch. You can't get it until one year from today and during that one year you can't ever eat chocolate or desire chocolate. You can't even think about chocolate. Now, let's say that you didn't even like chocolate. The moment I put this goal out there and dangle this in front of you, but put a stipulation on it, thou shalt not eat chocolate, thou shalt not lust for chocolate in your heart, you shall not even think about chocolate. Did you know that the moment I put that stipulation on it, some of you who didn't even like chocolate would go to lusting for it. You would think about chocolate constantly. And even if you could refrain yourself from going out and eating chocolate, I guarantee you in your heart, you would eat it a million times. It's just the way that we are. It's our nature. God didn't make us to be ruled over by thou shalt nots. He made us to be independent and there's just something inside of man that hates being ruled over, dominated, told that they can't do something. When somebody says, thou shalt not, something says, bless God, I shall. And you know what? That's the reason that God is the one that made us. He knew we were like that. And so, to bring us out of this deception that we could save ourselves and that we were pretty good and God's got to accept somebody, so I think God's going to accept me. You, you didn't recognize how bad sin was. You didn't recognize that you were already defiled. You know the way God brought you out of it? He said, thou shalt not. And he gave us all of these commands and all of a sudden sin came alive. It strengthened our lust for sin. The law will actually make a person want to sin more the more you preach law to a person.